You're listening to the Valley Current. Those, those sets of numbers are not really going to get beyond 92 years for either. either. Yes, it's not possible. The polio story has several important pieces of information that are critical in understanding what's going on. First of all, there are a couple of the cases that have been reported have occurred for a reason that has been known ever since Jonas Salk created the vaccine that is in current use in this country. We know that there are three polio types in the Salk vaccine, which is the killed vaccine that we're using. And that is that the uh, type 2 polio in the vaccine, despite the fact that it, it has been killed by uh, formaldehyde, mm-hmm. that the type 2 killed virus, which is in the vaccine, has a tiny 0.001 of the viruses still alive. And that will cause a case of hot polio, and I believe if I remember the data, one in three million vaccinees. There are two major concerns about that. The argument has been made that we will have to suffer the one in three million people or children who get hot polio in order to protect the tens of millions of other children and people who will benefit. Right. Which is a reasonable argument. Right. So And so the pharmaceutical companies said, okay, we'll live with that if you, the U.S. government, will do the following. And the U.S. government said, okay, we will do the following. What is the following? The following is that the National Institute of Health will set up a unit that looks into every case of hot polio in this country resulting from the vaccine that I explained, and we will compensate that family for four or five million bucks. And the pharmaceutical said, the company said, fine, that's, that's an insurance policy for us. Right. And that organization still exists in the in the NIH. And you wow. can find it on your computer if you want to spend a half hour trying to find it. I don't it's right. difficult to find. Right. So that's the story. The other story that you don't hear enough about is that the Sabin vaccine, which is the live polio vaccine is being brought into this country every single day and probably on every single airplane flight that discharges Europeans into this country who have received the Sabin vaccine, which is a live virus vaccine, so that when you see a person in this country who tests positive for polio, that may be a good thing. Because the Sabin vaccine is alive, but attenuated. It doesn't produce disease, uh, except in rare circumstances. And if you are in the household of a European who arrives vaccinated with Sabin vaccine, then what's called the the fecal-oral route is activated, especially if there's an infant in the family so that the Sabin vaccine is now spread amongst people who were not vaccinated, but they get vaccinated for free because the person carrying the Sabin vaccine has spread it around the family or the community or wherever they went, which is a good thing because people who weren't vaccinated now get vaccinated. So you you would say this data that's being collected might be uh, normal as opposed yes. to the way the press is turning it into exactly this, exactly the, exactly exactly the press is turning into another big deal overstating it it's turning in 
to fake news or or new something that allows more clicks on ads i guess because it's like it's it's gets people worried about there's post pandemic there's monkeypox post monkeypox there's polio post polio who knows what the next thing will be right it just sells That's more right. more ads right. right that's your argument that it's unfortunate that we don't have um, ad free journalism, the ads generate a lot of, of puff stories or stories that really are not a hundred percent accurate. And this polio thing is another, um, example of that is what you're saying is what you, yeah, you think. That's right. So you don't expect there to be like a major polio outbreak. No, I don't. Well, I'll take that back because what has happened since the Salkin Sabin vaccine, which were used early in the 50s and early 60s, once they were introduced and, and after a couple of years, the situation existed, much like today, where anti-vaxxers arose. And the polio vaccine is now given, now not given to very many children although it's, it's mandated in many schools, but not all, but so few that there is now a large number of people in this country who have never been vaccinated against polio. So you have a susceptible population out there waiting to be hit. Yeah, so, so there could be some newsworthiness to that insight, right? Of course, right? yes. Yeah. Well, it's been made, but but weekly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the real question is, um, are we living in a world where now we're all becoming hypochondriacs? Because the, <laughs> news, the newspapers are driving the stories in a direction that, you know, between climate change and um, overpopulation and potential of nuclear war and potential of World War III and um, monkeypox and polio and pandemic maybe not really ending. It's a very dangerous place to be. You have to factor into all of that with the facts that when you and I were kids, right. news traveled at the speed of light only with newspapers. Right. And telephone. Right. And, and uh, radio. And they are not instantaneous as the present technologies are. And they were not uh, international. When you and I were kids and you listened to uh, London calling, he was the only person in Europe who was calling from London. And you could hardly hear him. Sometimes it was screechy. Right. And uh, now that never happens. The technology is almost perfect. Uh, look at our communication at this moment. This was a dream. This was out of Buck Rogers when you and I were kids. So it's this instantaneous distribution of half-truths lies, errors of omission and commission that are occurring as we speak. And you and I have to sift through all of that garbage to find the truth. Right. So it's a different world in that respect. And it has given rise to people like Trump and Hitler and Mussolini, who know how to uh, tell the big lie. And get away with it. Well, get away with it and amplify it and use it to almost yeah. create a following, right? Of course. Look at the situation with Trump. You couldn't have a better example. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's, um, in, in a way, you could argue the ultimate amplifier here is Twitter. Like, Twitter is in the news because the tweets go out and draw people into all of this other quote unquote newsworthy discussion. 
and Twitter has become the new sort of um, nerve center for a lot of people's lives. They're li that, living on Twitter. That's why I have never been a member of Twitter. Never. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's an interesting thing because I think it creates a hyper reaction to every piece of news. And, and, I, and I don't think I have been, have, have neglected to understand the truth of news. I don't feel disadvantaged that I don't own a smartphone or that I don't belong to Twitter. I don't think I... have revealed to you my ignorance of current affairs no you have more you have more in-depth uh insights about current affairs most people on twitter have only superficial well, that, that's, that's just send a powerful message right right in fact there's an argument that we're creating um a world where insights are becoming rare because deep thought is becoming rare and deep thinking is becoming even rarer and critical, critical thinking critical thinking. critical deep deep thinking is becoming very rare and so this twitter mentality is very reactionary and um, very emotional and um, it's driving all these political campaigns even more than tv advertising to some degree these digital campaigns that are done online using Twitter. And so it's made Twitter kind of like um, the center of the world for a lot of, of, of populations or a lot of segments of the population, I guess I should say, even more so than Facebook and even more so than Instagram. Although Instagram is kind of a, kind of another version of Twitter, you could argue with a lot more pictures to it than anything else. But so you don't think, just to summarize, you don't think the polio story is a big story at this point. It could well, be coming. Only if it begins to reach probably the millions of unvaccinated uh, people in this country who have not received the polio vaccine. It's the same, as, same story as the COVID-19 story. If you don't get vaccinated against COVID-19, then you're, 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 you're at risk. And you're right. at risk, you're at risk of polio today in this country if you never had the vaccine. Right, and you're, you, you could argue that we're in for a regimen of vaccines on what seems like an ongoing basis. There's a fourth booster, I guess, of some sort I've had all three. I think you've had all three as well, right? I've had two. I've had four. Oh, you got the fourth one as well? Yes. And was the fourth one done at a pharmacy? Well, only because the local, uh, the local clinic didn't get supplied quickly, or they got supplied with a Moderna vaccine, and I wanted Pfizer, and so I arranged to have it administered at a pharmacy in Palo Alto. Okay, so you actually could request um, Pfizer versus Moderna on the fourth? Yes. Because you've had Pfizer before or you had Moderna? Yes. I've only had Pfizer and for reasons that, very technical reasons that I'm aware of, I prefer to st stay with the Pfizer. So your view is just stay with a single source brand in this case? Yes, Pfizer. although the, although the uh, argument is a very weak one. Yeah. Well, wasn't the, wasn't the polio vaccine ultimately a Pfizer product as well? Yes, it's my vaccine. Right. It's your vaccine, right? Pfizer. I sent you a picture of the Pfizer vaccines with my name on it. Right. Right. So Pfizer is sort of like a major player in this area and has been for decades. Well, yeah. right? well I don't know whether I told you how they started. No. No. Fantastic story. Yeah, well, how did they start? Pfizer was a small company that occupied the third floor of a building in Brooklyn. Yeah. And they made citric acid using a mold that grew on uh, large pans. 
And they essentially had a monopoly. Citric acid, as you know, is a common ingredient in citric fruits. Right. And it's also used in cooking and manufacturing. So they had a fairly nice business going along. Right. And, and then a friend of mine from Canada, who was a chemical and a, uh, a, a, a I think a physical or chemical engineer in 1920. Six couldn't get a job in Canada. He became later a vice president. That's and I knew him very well. A very close friend of mine, and that's how I know the story. Mm -hmm. So he came from Canada, looking for a job in the United States where opportunities were greater. And so right. I said, "Go to this company in Brooklyn called Pfizer, mm -hmm. and ask them whether they can use an engineer, a chemical engineer." So he mm -hmm. went there and they said, well, okay, if you want a job here, uh, the uh, crash just occurred, the 1929 crash. 1929, yeah. They said, we can't hire you, we have no money, but if you will help us or teach us or find out or discover how to grow this damn mold in fermentation tanks, you know, like beer is brewed in right. huge tanks of... 50,000 gallons right? using pans that got to be carried around by people and put on the shelves and into incubators and highly labor intensive. Right. They said, if you can find out how to grow this bloody mold and suspension, you got a job. <laughs> we'll save millions. And he said, okay. And he, he did it. Wow. He solved the problem. He grew the black mold in a fermentation tank. He saved them millions. They fired three quarters of their employees who didn't have to carry pants anymore. Wow. Jack was his first name. So Jack became a member of Pfizer and he didn't get, and they incorporated. They weren't incorporated prior. And they gave him stock in 1929, 1930, that they paid him in stock. And so over the years, he became vice president. And I got to know him. I'll tell you that later because there's an important story that inter intervenes. The story is that penicillin was discovered in England in 41 or two, no, in 28, 1928. It was discovered, but it wasn't exploited. It was just discovered. They also learned that penicillin had this magic uh, antibiotic activity. It was magic. It saved the and to save the lives of British soldiers. Right. And they said, how the hell can we make enough penicillin for the whole bloody army? We don't know how to do it. But there's one com company on the planet that knows how to grow molds and fermentation tanks. It's in Brooklyn in a loft on the third floor. So the Brits went up to Pfizer and they said, can you grow this penicillium mold like you grow the mold for citric acid production? We will give it a try, they said, and they did, it was easy. And that's how Pfizer became the only company in the world to make penicillin. And they set up factories in every leading country's country of the world to produce it and became what a billion dollar company and jack rose to vice president he became extremely wealthy and when i moved to the university of florida he was retired in key biscayne and he called me and he said len i want you to come to my house i want to talk to you about something so i flew down to key biscayne and he said he had a beautiful apartment on the top floor of a hotel, and he, he had two units that he merged. Mm -hmm. He was a wonderful, brilliant guy. He said, I want to give you some money to, this, to try to discover whether mycoplasmas cause human arthritis. Because he had an interest in these organisms, and I was an expert, and still am, on this strange group of organisms. I won't go into those details. I said, yes, I'll do that, Jack. I'm interested in that question as well. So he sent to the University of Florida 
I don't know, 1,000 or 2,000 or some thousand shares of original Pfizer stock. Right. Turned out to be worth a quarter of a million dollars when I sold it. Wow. And that's what supported my lab there and here in Palo Alto and uh, UCSF for a couple of years. So he he gifted <laughs> some of his appreciated stock over for the purpose of aiding your research. Yes. He didn't give me money. He gave me stock. He had loads of it. Yeah. He was paid in stock in the late 20s, in the early 30s. Right. The stock is worth millions. What, what's his last name? Jack. I, I always block on his last name, but I do have it written down. And but he should, but he should really be on the so Pfizer website as like the reason that Char it was really called Charles Pfizer and Company. Yeah, well, I would hope so. In their history, I would hope so. You're saying he really made the huge difference to that company in Brooklyn that was gambling and, and to the and to the world in respect to penicillin production right right I mean they say on the website that penicillin was discovered by Alexander Fleming yes that was done in 1928 not at 1928, Pfizer 1928 right yes and he exactly. was Jack, uh, uh, it's a common yeah. last name. I just can't think of. He he is the guy who figured out how to actually make it in high production in fermentation tanks. Right. Yeah, that's an interesting story. And I don't see anything on the website listing any Jack at all by by any name. As the generations turn over the history, the early history of organizations gets lost. Was his formal name Jasper Kane, K-A-N-E? No. Because they report that Pfizer researchers led by Jasper Kane used shallow flasks and pans like those that were used for citric acid. They made gradual pro progress in improving penicillin's potency. The breakthrough came when Kane suggested a different approach, the deep tank method that proved successful for gluconic. He may, have, he may have suggested it, but he never achieved it. Yeah, so you're saying this other gentleman came in. Well, they're hyping somebody. Yeah, yeah. This Jack's last name is not Kane. His first name is not Jasper, right? Correct. Yeah, understood. So, Len, this is a really interesting story, and you've had your fourth vaccine and you don't need a polio vaccine right no i don't i've had it of course i've i've made the vaccine so i've administered it, it to myself and my children right so i don't need it, it it's a pretty much a lifelong protection right you take it once you probably took it when you were in your teenager or even before right no i took it uh when i i took the vaccine that i made okay in 1964. Okay, so you're you're you you took it when you were in your in well. Your... Uh, I take that back. I gave it to my children then when I invent when I uh, invented it, produced WI38. But I did have the either the Sabin or the Salk. I don't remember. I had it early 1950s when it first was available. Yeah. Because it was con it was considered to be a serious disease. I mean, you know how it crippled people and killed people. Right. And uh, there came a time, like today with COVID, when it was administered to millions of people in this country, and then the anti-vaxxers arose. And what happened then was people stopped taking polio. And I have published a paper saying you've got to get these anti-vaxxers to stop telling lies. And the only, there's only one way to do it. And I suggested, and I'm suggesting it even today with COVID-19, I suggested then that you pay unemployed actors and actresses to walk around the streets of the centers of cities 
in wheelchairs and canes with signs saying, I'm a polio victim. And that's how you get people back on track as they were in the uh, 50s and 40s who were afraid of polio. Right. So today we need to have COVID-19 actors and actresses around, walking around the streets and in wheelchairs saying, I'm at on cane, saying, I'm in this condition because I didn't take the vaccine. Now maybe you'll get some takers. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because um, that would be a form of fake news because you're making it up, but it would make a good point, which yeah. is, this is what you need to avoid. It's a little bit like those TV commercials that existed. I haven't seen them recently where a smoker is like breathing through their tracheotomy. Like they have a hole in their yeah. Hole yeah. In their windpipe and they yeah. say, don't let this happen to you. I was a smoker for 50 exactly, years. Exactly. Exactly. They can't breathe anymore. Yeah, but it's 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 fake news, like most of the movies that people are watching are fake news. It's all it's all uh, untrue. Right. You know, Len, you're a fountain of of knowledge on so many different subjects, and I was so interested in getting your reaction on both the question of what's happening to the life expectancy as well as what's what's happening now with this polio this alleged polio outbreak and i think i think you really summarized it pretty well which is maybe we have to fix the way the news is is delivered in a way that actually creates greater intelligence because the last piece is it looks like all the kids test scores have gone down in recent news all the test scores are declining so to some degree, this pandemic has had a real uh, effect on what you might say is the intelligence quotients of future generations, maybe lots of them, right? Yeah, but we don't, there's a lot of detail that we don't know about. There, many of those kids have been taught at home by their parents or teachers who are unable to work. There's a lot of other issues involved. Yes, it's a serious problem, but I don't know that it's as serious as it's being portrayed. Right. Yeah, understood. But thanks, Len, for coming on. I really appreciate your time. Talk to you later. Take care in the meantime. Bye-bye. You, you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Tune in next time on The Valley Current.